Beginning this morning, I would like to share with you over the next couple of weeks some of the Old Testament prophecies, some of the prophecies that Christ fulfilled. As we enter into the season in which we celebrate his birth, uh, the advent of our Savior, we look forward to his, his coming again so that he might gather his people, uh, that they might be with him for an eternity. That was the whole reason that he came, was to make a way that you and I might be in his presence uh, that where he eternally dwells. So if you would, take your Bible and turn with me to Luke in chapter 7. We want to look at one of the, uh, the questions that was posed to Jesus uh, during his ministry while he was here on this earth, and it came from, nonetheless, John the Baptist. John the Baptist, we know, was, uh, was Elizabeth's son, uh, Elizabeth and Zacharias. We know that when Mary conceived of the Holy Spirit, uh, the child Jesus that she went to visit Elizabeth, and before, after her salutation, we know that Elizabeth was with child with John the Baptist. It said that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and the, le- the, the babe leaped in her womb and at, at, the, uh, at the appearance of Mary. By the time we get to Luke in chapter 7, we find John the Baptist's ministry as the forerunner of Christ has come about. We know that he's been in prison. He's been put into jail by King Herod because of his, uh, his opposition to Herod's uh, lifestyle, his immorality. We know eventually that he would be beheaded, that John the Baptist would never see the light of day anymore. But uh, it wouldn't be too long after. It would not be too long after we read the question that he poses to Jesus that he would be beheaded. So let's look in Luke in chapter 7, beginning in verse 19. And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were coming to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or or look we for another? And in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and evil spirits. And unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer this morning. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the coming of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we recognize that he was the one that was foretold of old. Lord, that he would suffer and bleed and die on Calvary's cross. And Lord, that he would be resurrected on the third day that we through our faith in him might have hope of eternal life. And it's a hope that maketh not ashamed. Lord, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's kind of ironic that John would send two of his disciples to question Jesus. Are you the Messiah? Are you the one that's been prophesied? Are you the one that's been foretold? Knowing that before he was born... John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb just at the the hearing of Mary's appearance. Now, by the time we get to this point, we know that many of the Jews were looking for a Messiah who would restore the nation of Israel to rule, uh, to govern themselves. But we know also, as I shared last, uh, last week, that the nation of Israel had been carried into captivity on numerous occasions uh, as a result of God's judgment upon them for, for disobeying him. We know that they had suffered under the Babylonians. They had suffered under the Greek. At this point in time, they're now under Roman rule. Now it is John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, the one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make your way straight, make his way straight. Now he has come to even question uh, not only within himself, but he verbalizes his, his doubt as if Jesus, if he is the Messiah, if he is the one to come to deliver the nation of Israel. Now, there are several Old Testament prophecies in, <clears throat> excuse me, that I want us to look at this morning. <clears throat> excuse me. The first is this. 
John was posing a question. He knew what the Old Testament prophecy said. One of the first Old Testament prophecies that Jesus fulfilled was the place in which he was to be born. We know that ultimately Jesus was to be born in Bethlehem. The prophet Micah, the only reference to Bethlehem in the Old Testament, makes a prophecy concerning the Messiah that would be born. He says in Micah in chapter 5 and verse 2, But thou Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephrah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going, goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. In the New Testament church, obviously, we can look at that and we can relate it to New Testament Scripture where Jesus actually fulfilled that prophecy of being born in Bethlehem. I'll give you a couple of examples. If you're making notes, there's a place on your bulletin. If you want to write these Scripture passages down, feel free to do so. The first is, comes in the New Testament where Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy in Matthew in chapter 2 and verse 1. It says this, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. The first prophecy was fulfilled in where he would be born. Matthew makes it very plain. If that's not enough, you can look to Luke in chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife being great with child and so it was that while they were there the days were accomplished that she should be delivered you see do you see the point the Old Testament prophecy was fulfilled in the birth of Christ at the place where he was to be born secondly we see of whom or Jesus would be born of whom. The Bible tells us that he was to be born of a woman. This is Old Testament prophecy and, and that that woman ultimately was to be a virgin. Isaiah prophesies this in Isaiah in chapter 7 in verse 4. He says this, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel which is God with us. We know that. And New Testament, New Testament writings, we find two Gospels that agree. Again, Matthew in chapter 1, verses 22 through 23. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of, by the, of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Again, the Gospel of Luke, the physician, the precise person of all of the Gospels, we find Luke includes more details than, than the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Or excuse me, Matthew, Mark, and John. I'll get that right in a minute. Luke says this in his passage in chapter 1 and verses 26 through 31. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to, uh, from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. If you consider this, I know that some of you are thinking in the back of your mind, Preacher, why are you confirming in the New Testament what was prophesied in the Old? If you look at John, John being the cousin, knowing who Jesus was, being the forerunner, he himself had pronounced Jesus as the Lamb of God. Remember at the baptismal? You remember at the baptismal? He baptizes Jesus and he pronounced, Behold the Lamb of God. He saw the heavens open and the Spirit of God descending upon 
Jesus. But now that he's imprisoned, he sends message to Jesus. Are you the one? Or do we need to look for someone else? Friends, let me, let me make a statement to you real quickly. The Old Testament to the New Testament, the Bible from cover to cover speaks of the Redeemer, the Savior. It points the way to Him. It points the way through Him. So if there's ever a question in your mind as to who the Redeemer, the Savior is, we can confirm it with the Word of God. Again, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. In the Bible, from cover to cover, I believe that the Bible is God's Word. That it is in error. There is no mixture of error. That it's inspired. And that it's infallible. So you see, it all boils down to what you believe about the Word of God. And it forms your opinion as to the identity of Christ. We see that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He was born of a woman who was a virgin. We also find that he was a descendant. He was to be a descendant of Abraham. In Genesis in chapter 12, or excuse me, Genesis in chapter 22 and verse 18, I put this passage up there for you. I'm going to read Genesis chapter 12 here in just a moment. It's recorded for us, and in thy seed, this is the agreement, the covenant between God and Abraham. God is speaking to Abraham because of his obedience, we find, it, to what God tells him to do in Genesis in chapter 12. But it tells us in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18, And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. How do we know what was the task, what was the commandment, what, what bound the covenant between Abraham and God? Genesis in chapter 12, I referred to a while ago, verses 1 through 3. God tells Abraham, he says this, Now the Lord hath said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. The blessing that, that each and every person on this face of this earth, each and every individual, each and every family, the name of the person who blesses us the most is Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. The greatest blessing that you can receive today is salvation because Jesus was born. Because Jesus died. Because Jesus was resurrected. The Bible tells us that, that sin happened in the Garden of Eden. It tells us that because sin happened in the Garden of Eden, that sin was passed upon every generation of mankind. That you and I were not born guiltless, but that we were born guilty. Guilty in the eyes of a holy God. Guilty because by nature we were born sinful. And the Bible tells us the result of that gift, that guilt, the result of that gift, guilt, I'll get it out in a minute. The result of that guilt, guilt, I almost said it again. I'm trying not to spit this peppermint out. The result of that guilt is God's wrath and God's judgment. You see, being guilty of sin in the eyes of God, we're unworthy to enter into His presence. And therefore, He made a way for you and I to be redeemed, to be made right, to put on righteousness so that we might enter into His presence. 
And that way was through his son coming to this earth, being conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, in the place that was prophesied of the seed that God promised. I've already alluded to this. But I've tried to share with you this morning how, where the Messiah was to be born, of whom he was to be born. Let's talk about why he was to be born. Jesus was born for primarily two purposes. We could really sum it down or sum it up to one purpose, but we find prophecy concerning Jesus in relation to two purposes. First of all, the conquering of Satan. The conquering of Satan. God promised this all the way back in Genesis in chapter 3 and verse 15. Remember the result of sin? In the, was, it, it came from the garden. The result of our sin came from the garden. It was because the serpent who beguiled Eve, he was wise. He beguiled Eve to, that, and caused her to sin. In turn, it led to Adam sinning. And because Adam sinned, you and I were born guilty, not guiltless. God there, right then and there, promised Satan that he would be defeated. If you look at the passage I put up on the screen, <coughs> Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. God tells Satan, he says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. We look at this and we see, obviously there are a couple of points that I want to bring out. But I like what C.I. Schofield says in his study notes. He says, the chain of references which begins here includes the promises and prophecies concerning Christ, <coughs> which were fulfilled in his birth and works at his first advent. The Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary says this, the serpent wounds the heel that crushes him, and so Satan would be permitted to afflict the humanity of Christ and bring suffering and persecution on his people. The serpent's poison is lodged in, his, in its head, and a bruise on that part is fatal. Thus fatal shall be the stroke which Satan shall receive from Christ. Though it is probable, he did not at first understand the nature and extent of his doom. Matthew Henry says that here in this passage, God passes sentence. And he begins where sin began with the serpent. The devil's instruments must share in the devil's punishment. Under the cover of the serpent, the devil is sentenced and to be degraded and accursed of God, detested and abhorred of all mankind, also to be destroyed and ruined at last by the great Redeemer, signified by the breaking of his head. War is proclaimed between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. We find this passage being fulfilled in the New Testament in Hebrews in chapter 2. In verses 14 and 15, the writer of Hebrews says this, For as much then as the children are partakers <coughs> of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them through... Who who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, descendant of Abraham, <coughs> came to destroy and conquer Satan in all of his devices. If Satan came and tempted humanity, and continues to do so. But Christ came to conquer, and to defeat, and to overcome. We've got to understand also 
that Jesus Christ was born for the salvation or redemption of mankind. We find this passage in the New Testament. Some say it would be exclusively in the New Testament. But, and I'm not going to jump back over there, but we find the prophet Isaiah foretelling of the suffering servant. He says, for he was led as a lamb to slaughter, yet opened he not his mouth. The Gospel of Matthew tells us in Matthew in chapter 1 and verse 21, actually I'll back up and read verse 20 for you. It says, but while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, this is Joseph, speaking of Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Pay special attention to this last phrase. For he shall save his people from their sins. Again, we find it in the fourth chapter of the book of Galatians. In verses 4 and 5 it says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, pay special attention to this last verse, verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. That word redeem. That word redemption. It's a term in which was used considering a slave. If a slave was to gain his freedom, a price had to be paid for that slave to come out of bondage and to be declared a free man. So that word redemption or redeem symbolized or signified someone paying the price for freedom of the bonded, of those who are in bondage. What Galatians tells us is this, is that Jesus Christ came to pay the price so that you and I might be made free. And the scripture tells us, and when we, when we become free in Christ, we're free indeed. The Gospel of John records for us these words, Jesus' own words, I might add. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Friends, how do we establish what is truth and what is a lie? How do we determine, how do we determine what is fact and what is fiction? Once again, I point you to the Word of God. And the inerrancy, and the infallibility, and the inspiration from which we find it. God inspiring man to write and to record his perfect, full, and complete word. From beginning to end, from cover to cover, it speaks of the sin of man, the sacrifice of the Savior, and the salvation that's made possible. John sent two of his disciples to Jesus, perhaps because he was looking for a different type of Messiah. But man's greatest need, your greatest need and my greatest need today, is salvation and grace and mercy. Jesus paid the price that he didn't know because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. Consider those words of prophecy 
and the confirmation that we find of it in, in God's Word. Consider your identity in Christ. And if you have questions, please, please come to me. Let me point you to God's Word where we find the truth revealed. The Bible tells us it's for by grace through faith are we saved. Jesus told the disciples of John, And blessed is he who shall not be offended in me. Friend, do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior this morning? If you don't, would you, would you mind just coming and visiting with me this morning? I'll make myself available. Christian friend, has there ever been a time in your mind in which you've doubted if Jesus was the one? God's Word confirms it. And that settles it. Search God's Word. Search it out. So that you can be assured of your salvation. 